Hi, I am Dr. Arka from Department of Hepatology at PJM at Chandigarh. I'll be discussing a case that we recently did of endoscopic US guided uh, coil and clue embolization of, a, of gastric pharesis. So we had this 47 year old male patient who was a known case of decompensated cirrhosis related to alcohol who had a past history of upper GI bleed and he was on endoscopic varicella ligation along with beta blockers prophylaxis. And he presented to us in the emergency with hematomesis. He was started on terlipresin and antibiotics and his hemoglobin levels were built up. And when we took him up for endoscopy, what we found that in the esophagus, there was only scarring and there were no viruses. The viruses had been eradicated, but there was this humongous fundal varix along with RCS. So usually we tackle the fundal varix by Endo endoscopic guided injection of clue via the, from the uh, uh, luminal side. Now the problem in a large varix in this in this kind of a scenario, the nightmare for the endoscopist is that the moment you withdraw the needle after injecting the glue, there's a torrential rush and there's a spurt of blood and the whole fundus gets filled up with blood and the varix sinks in this rising pool of blood. So given the fact that the fundal varix in this patient was very large, and he was not actively bleeding at that moment, we decided to go ahead with a US guided coil and flu injection. So this is basically the gastric varix. And varix can easily be visualized when we insert in the scope is round about at the G junction at the scope being in the neutral position that is your left hand being in the sleeping position and so we see, we see that this is the gastric varix there's a conglomerate of the varix that we can see and you can see the extreme turbulent flow inside these blood vessels on doppler so the problem really is that with the left hand being in the neutral position, that is the left hand being in the sleeping position, it is very difficult to perform the therapeutic maneuver. So what we are trying to do over here is we are actually trying to rotate, you know, torque it and completely rotate towards the right. We can see the gastrointestinal shunt just went through. We'll talk about that later. But as you can see that we are completely rotating towards the right such that it rotates even further and begins to face towards the fundus and here you can see that now actually we are kind of facing towards the screen we are facing forward and we still have the gastric barracks in position this will make therapeutic maneuvers easier so now let us try to trace out the perforators, the feeding vessels to the gastric varics. And here we could just see the gastrorenal shunt. So all the black things that you were seeing, these were the blood vessels. So as we now remove the Doppler, what we will find is that this gastric varix, this is being supplied by the afferents are coming from the gastrorenal shunt. And this appears to be a main feeder, but what we can see is that there are basically multiple feeders and there are multiple afferents that are coming towards the gastric varics largely they are originating from the gastrorenal shunt you can see this main feeder probably this looks like one of the main feeders however one of the points to note is that that is not we, what we will be targeting our target will be the varicial conglomerate that is surrounded by the stomach wall Therefore, one of the tricks to really localize that we are targeting the gastric varics and not other collaterals is to inject water. Now, as we inject water and the water will come into the fundus, we will see that the lumen gets separated out and that gives you, you know, uh, corroborates the fact that yes, that this is indeed the gastric varics which is surrounded by the wall of the stomach. Now, the procedure of doing the US guided procedure. So basically we get the sheath of the needle out and get into a stable position. Now here we are doing the puncture, we will be doing the puncture transesophageally. Why? Because when we had done the previous upper GI, what we found that the, the esophageal varices were eradicated.
The advantage of doing it transesophageally is that you know you don't if you do you can also do it from the fundus, but then there could be a chance of bleeding into the fundus. But doing it transesophageally, that chance would be less. But obviously, if the patient does have large varices, then a transesophageal route gets automatically precluded. And apart from looking at the GE junction, the other clue would be look at the crura on the US. So your needle uh, your sheath should be above the crura of the diaphragm. So we get into a stable position and we also measure the size of the gastric pharynx. So here what we can see is that like these are kind of septa of the conglomerate of the pharynx and we will just measure the size of the pharynx. We have done it previously and the size that we had measured it was around 3.4 mm and what was lost out also in the editing was we had measured the size of that you know the what we thought was a main prominent feeding vessel and that was around 1 to 1.2 centimeters in size now why is measuring this diameter of the varex important because the size of the coil that you put in the total diameter of the coils that we are going to insert should definitely be larger than the size of the varix. Why? Such that it doesn't embolize. How much larger? The literature goes between 1.2 to 1.6 times larger. So assuming that the size of this varix was 3.4 centimeters, the 1.2 times is coming around 4 centimeters. Therefore, the largest coil, largest diameter coil that is available with us is a 20 mm coil. It's so 2 centimeters in diameter and it is 20 centimeters in length. The length is not important. What is important is the diameter. So, the largest diameter we have is a 20 mm coil. So, we decided to insert at least two 20 mm coils that would amount to a diameter of 4 centimeters and then we would see if a third coil would be required or not. So that was the strategy that we are going to follow now. So our sheet is in position, our scope is in a stable position and we advance the needle forward into the gastric pharynx. So we can now see that our needle is inside the gastric pharyngeal lumen. Now we begin to load the coil into the needle. So the coil is being need, uh, loaded and during this time it is very important that we continue to hold a stable position such so that the needle remains inside the gastric pharyngeal lumen. So you can see that these are the septa and it almost looks like there are two compartments, an upper compartment and a lower compartment. And so we are first trying to deploy this coil in the upper compartment. And there you see the coil, the first coil is getting deployed, that highly ecogenic thing that is coming out of the needle, that is the coil. And you can see that almost the full upper compartment is getting filled up with that coil. So the coil has now been completely deployed. The first coil has now been completely deployed and now what I'm going to do is I'm just trying to slowly advance my needle a little bit more and puncture through this septa and then close maybe stay in the lower compartment or stay close to it but at least the septa gets punctured such that when we deploy the second coil the second coil is now getting loaded in the needle so that we have punctured through the septa you can see that I'm being able to go lower down into that such that when the second coil gets deployed, it will get deployed in this lower compartment and we are able to fill this lower compartment also. So what is the purpose of putting in these coils? Such that these coils act as a scaffolding for the glue that we will inject later on, you know, to polymerize against, to solidify against. And this scaffolding with the polymerized glue, with the solidified glue cast, that will result in a lesser number of coils being required and a lesser amount of smaller volume of glue being required which will all ultimately result maybe also in a lesser risk of embolization. So we can see that the second coil is beginning to get deployed, it is coming out of the needle and it is now filling beautifully into the lower part what we thought was the lower what we were was looking like the lower compartment of the gastric veins. it's now getting filled it is falling into that nicely into place. And now as you can see that the second coil that is also been completely deployed. 
So once that is done, we just injected the D5, you know, ensuring that the entire needle hub remains blood free. We have injected the D5, flushed it out. And now we will begin to inject the glue. And as soon as we begin to inject the glue, what we will find how quickly the entire conglomerate, you know, begins to get opacified. Note here, we are injecting the butyl cyanoacrylate, the smaller side chain, therefore it will polymerize quicker. Therefore, we inject the glue much faster. We have injected 2 ml of glue and then we will flush out the remnant glue in the, uh, in the needle hub with dextrose and now we have pulled back the, the needle. And we can see how nicely opacified this is the area of the gastric barracks and how we can see the metal coils along with the glue cast there. So we continue to observe that area. So this was that area. The reason is because we can see that there is still some remnant variceal areas, variceal luminal areas that are left. It's important to continue to observe because the flow will begin, will decrease with time. And also we are just observing that, look, none of, nothing is embolizing away into any of the bigger perforators. So you see the coils must should continue to remain in position. And we just put in the Doppler and this is the area of the varix and we find that no there is still some persistent residual blood flow in this area despite having you know put in two coils and two ml of glue. We decided not to go against another coil because of the cost perspective and inject one ml more of glue instead. So we can see that our needle is inserted into the gastric varix into that remnant part and again we flush with dextrose and once we have flushed it with dextrose we inject 1 ml more of glue and as we will begin to inject the glue we will find again you know the space is getting opacified and once we have flushed away the remnant glue in the dead space of the needle you know with the dextrose again we withdraw the needle. And as we have completed the procedure, now we see that how well even the remnant spaces have gotten opacified with the coil acting as a scaffold. So a total of 40 mm of coil acting as a scaffold for with 3 mm of glue. And when we repeat the Doppler, we see that practically there is no remnant blood flow in the area of the pharynx. So around 10 to 15 minutes after the US procedure was com completed, we did forward wing upper G endoscopy and we had injected the coil and the glue for the transesophageal route and here is the esophageal puncture site on uh, forward wing endoscopy and it's a neat and clean puncture site and there is no bleed. And again if you look at the fundus, there is again no blood, so it's a clean procedure, again no complication of any bleed. And when we probe it with the cannula, we find that it is completely hard and hence obturation of the gastric varix is confirmed. Thank you so much. And I must acknowledge the help of uh, Dr. Rohit, Kuldeep and Kanhaya for assisting in the procedure.